Well, what does 1 Corinthians 15 teach? Well, I noticed that I couldn't understand the book of Revelation without the Old Testament. And I couldn't understand the Olivet Discourse without the Old Testament. And I then concluded that the Old Testament is the answer to 1 Corinthians 15. Now, Paul would say that the gospel involves the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And that he was buried, and that he rose again after three days. Well, there's only one Old Testament text which speaks about a third day resurrection, and that's Hosea 6, 2 and 3. So, after two days he'll revive us, and the third day he'll raise us up. That gave me consternation. I didn't think that could reference the resurrection of Christ. But if Christ represents Old Covenant Israel, that is, he is their Savior, that through his resurrection they would be saved. So now let's look at what's going on at 1 Corinthians 15. There is a group of involved false teachers. They are denying the resurrection of the dead ones. I think they're Judaizers. Why do I think they're Judaizers? Because in 2 Corinthians 11, 23, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. What did the Judaizers want? They wanted the law to remain. What I believe is, is that they made the argument that Jesus' presence was already in Hades, therefore they're already cleansed. They're already having their reward. So there's no need for resurrection of the dead ones. Well, Christ is the first fruits. He's the first one who's accomplished that fact, gotten out of the Hadean world. So in order for Israel to receive their blessings in the Hadean world, they too would have to come out of Hades. And that's what the Bible teaches, resurrection out of the Hadean world. That's what Daniel 12 is all about. So what Paul is doing is putting an intricate argument together about the false teachers who were denying the resurrection of the dead ones, the same one that said that the resurrection is past already in 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18. And what there is saying is they already have the reward, were already raised, no further resurrection, which would mean that the law would remain. Now, our position is that the law would remain. Now, we'll get back to 1 Corinthians 15 a little bit uh, more. So when Paul says, then comes the end, he's not talking about the end of human history. He's talking about the end, the same end that Peter speaks about. The end of all things is at hand. It's the same end that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24, 14. This gospel will be preached unto all the world for a witness, and then the end will come. The Jews never had in mind at end of the planet. The Old Testament didn't teach that. The earth abides forever. What they had in mind was the end of their age. And that would take place at the coming of the Lord when that temple was destroyed and every stone was dismantled. Now, I think the same thing is involved in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The resurrection of the dead ones. And so there are present tense verbs going on in 1 Corinthians 15 as well. So they were being, it was being sown in corruption, their body. It was being raised, present tense verb, in incorruption. Finally, when the process is completed and the dead ones out of Hades are resurrection, the new heaven, the new earth, and the new body is raised. Our position is that there's only one body that needs to be raised, and that's a covenant body. I don't believe the physical body harbors sin, therefore it doesn't need to be redeemed. It's just a, this proleptical approach to the body of the New Testament. So there's one body, the Bible says. Well, that body had redemption because it was sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's the miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit for 40 years until the redemption of our body. I don't think Paul is speaking about the redemption of the biological body in Romans 8.23. The redemption, the Bible says, and the adoption pertains to Israel, Romans 9, 4. Now, who had died? Romans 8, 10. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So the dead body of Israel dies. The Holy Spirit is put into that body, bringing it back life, and adopting that body. And soon, he would enliven or raise our mortal bodies, Romans 8, 11. Now, I used to believe that meant our physical, fit, fleshly bodies. There were two bodies of people. Ephesians 2 is about Jew-Gentile coming into one body. When Paul says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, he's not talking about your biological existence. He's talking about two kinds of people who are being blended together into one. So the mortal bodies are Jew-Gentile. 
being fused into one over the process of the revealing of the Spirit. And so the Spirit is sent into this body and it would raise them up. Now the same Spirit that raises up this body raised up Christ. As far as I know, Christ was raised up miraculously. So what? He's not miraculous and at the end of time he's going to come miraculous again in your body and raise you up? No, 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 no. This resurrection is Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39. This is the resurrection of the old covenant body of Israel. And in addition, the Gentiles are coming in. So now, please notice, a body that dies. A Holy Spirit is sent into that body. The two mortal existence, which means liable to death, Jew and Gentile, are soon to be done away. And the Spirit is sent into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Now, Abba, Baba, in the Eastern, is the way a little boy addresses his dad. He's looking for his father. He's wanting relationship. And so they're growing up in Christ. He's bringing them up into maturity of Christ. Soon there would be the redemption and the adoption of our body. Singular subject, plural pronoun.